your personality has to come through somehow. But I think there are creative ways to do that. Business of Architecture, episode 350. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building an architecture practice that helps you do your best work more often. Today, our topic is how to increase your firm's visibility. My guest is Carl Feldman of the professional services marketing firm Hinge. Hinge is known for their well-researched and cutting-edge industry reports. In our last episode, you heard Kelly Waffle and Carl of Hinge interview me for the Visible Expert podcast. Today, I interview Carl here on this show. And in our interview, you'll discover what to consider if you want to heighten your firm's visibility, including the first step you should take. You'll learn what your clients really want and how to be the firm that delivers it to them. Carl, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thanks for having me, Nick. So tell us, how does Hinge help AEC firms? Oh boy, where to start? Uh, we're, we serve professional services firms and that ranges across verticals. AEC firms probably represent about a third of our clients and we help with everything from branding programs, rebranding, uh, merger and acquisition, branding and integration strategy to uh, overall marketing and BD strategy, websites, collateral, pursuit materials, the whole gamut. So we are really a full service agency, but uh, we like to ground that in research. And that's something that our industry is catching on to, but compared to the other verticals we serve, we don't do quite enough of it yet. So tell me about that. First of all, what are the other industries you serve and how do they differ in their approach to marketing and becoming visible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the other verticals might be management consulting or technology firms, even uh, accounting finance and legal firms. And then, of course, hybrids that are somewhere in between. Uh, but I'd say AEC firms, seeing a lot of strength and has certainly grown in terms of how how we brand and market and communicate and you know, kind of uh, bring our expertise to market, but we're still a bit behind in terms of ledger leveraging the kind of data resources and even qualitative research that uh, some of the other professional services, especially management consulting, have really taken advantage of. And you know that. That, I think, is such a huge opportunity for us because we have such a wealth of really interesting and engaging audiences. And the challenge is huge because there's so many different markets and uh, different perspectives out there that it really is a, a great opportunity for AEC firms. What is the opportunity that you're seeing for AEC firms specifically? Well, I'll start with research and strategy, but there's is a wide range, you know, and jumping off from what we were talking about with the opportunity to understand uh, clients and, you know, prospective clients and even influencers better. Uh, I think the real opportunity is to tap in in a relevant way. You know, so often AEC firms are somewhere on the on the opposite ends of you know, we are describing ourselves related to the services that we provide and what we do and our work experience and credentials, or we want to get all the way on the other side of the table and say, it's all about you. But in order to really be effective, it's, it's how do you meet in the middle there? So what, what's the intersection of, you know, the great expertise that so many AEC firms bring and the real issues that that audiences are trying to solve down to the communities we, we serve. Carl Hinge talks a lot about this idea of relevancy and especially as it refers to marketing, branding, getting visibility in the marketplace. Do you have any examples to help our audience understand what's meant when you talk about relevancy? Yeah. And it, it is, um, I have to say, you know, relevancy, I have a bit of recency bias because that's something that was a really big trend in our most recent studies. You know, we've seen this, uh, the, the 
difference, if you want to describe it, between the firms that are really growing strong and have been resilient in such an uncertain time and those that are kind of scrambling to, to get back on pace is largely one of relevancy. Uh, so being able to speak about yourselves, your teams, your services in a way that helps solve a specific problem that audience has, uh, an audience has, that really makes the difference between activity and seeing actual impact from, you know, marketing initiatives, uh, efforts like that. So, for example, uh, if you think of you know, a design firm, right, then you take kind of what what is happening in the world uh, in urban spaces, a lot of uncertainty out there. Uh, we have an unprecedented uh, health crisis that we're dealing with. That's on everyone's mind, no matter where you are, and it impacts our clients in different ways. So what kinds of projects are you working on or what is your thinking and approach to some of these really fast moving challenges that are coming at us and then how quickly can you take that conversation out into a digital space and and speak with audiences and and what do you have to add to that conversation you know if you if you're kind of focusing on you know we do k-12 and we're just speaking about you know we have flexible spaces and we do these things and we're not talking about what are we doing to keep our students and teachers safe you know that may be joining forces with environmental engineering teaming partners those types of things is great opportunities to speak very relevantly to what's what's going on what i'm hearing you say Carl, is that relevancy is, as you mentioned, addressing a client's business issues, and it may be things beyond what are typically, uh, maybe perhaps the things that architects typically think about. If I were to take a poll of my audience and I would ask them, what are the problems you solve for your clients? A lot of them would say, well, they have, they have facilities needs That's and need right. more space. <laughs> That's right. How is that? How is that? that? Yeah. How is that either wrong or, or how is that perhaps missing the mark as we talk about relevancy? Right. right. Well, even in that in that context, uh, if you take that example and think about it from the other side of the table, why do you need more space? How much capital do you have to work with to increase that space? And how flexible does that space need to be? Considering not only the how and what, but why. So understanding what are the community pressures that are driving that? What's the curriculum pressures that are driving the need for more flexible space? And again, I, I can't I can't ignore the the world we're in right now. How do you do that in this new environment where we have, you know, practically life or death issues facing us? Yeah. So it's um it's it's one thing I have my joke analogy is it's one thing to be the most excellent dog walker you could be like you have the best dog walking service in the world, but your client's house is on fire. Unless the dog walking somehow helps with that, you're not going to be relevant. So it's how do you, how do you connect these things? You know, a lot of times there are macro issues or even, uh, you know, concerns or anxieties that help to really focus uh, your, your uh, expertise. Carl, I love your analogy of the walking the dog while the house is on fire. We provide yeah. a dog walking service. Yeah. Can, can you think of any examples of uh, firms that you've worked with, either from the AEC vertical or perhaps from another vertical, where they were able to do something different? In other words, they're able to address the, the building burning, for instance, the, the real emergency or the, the, the needs mm -hmm. of the client that they're trying to work with. Mm -hmm. You got me thinking about the whole health impacts. I um, Maybe I'll, I'll think about a design practice, but in the engineering space and, and fairly re recently, uh, we had a client who was you know, pre-pandemic pre listening to their clients. So this is an environmental engineering firm. They do a lot of health and safety regulatory work. 
uh, they're dealing with a lot of these uh, healthcare systems that are not the huge Centeras of the world, but smaller portfolios, groups of healthcare uh, hospitals, regional hospital systems. And they realized that one of their the big issues that they were having was how they reported uh, their compliance with regulations. So say, for example, how they manage uh, uh, their in-house pharmacy and how they complied with different regulations internally. There's all kinds of fancy systems for that, but some of those are actually related to the facilities, how that's managed, what kind of uh, air quality systems are happening or even security controls. And so by listening to these issues, which they didn't really tap into with a direct service, they understood, hey, we can help make our services plug into this more easily by helping to format this in a framework that complies with regulations and lets the client just fill in the other things through this nice electronic dashboard. So here's, here's something where uh, the client has a need or an issue that's actually really different from what, um, what this engineering firm is scoped to work on. However, through their work, they had this vehicle to really help the client with, you know, their house is on fire. And here's this other thing that, and that ranged from C-suite through to facilities operators and actual staff. Uh, and that was a big win. I mean, that actually helped them extend their services because after that, that process, they were seen as a real partner and they didn't nickel and dime to do that. It really wasn't that much extra effort on their part. It was just that awareness of what, what was happening around them on the client's side of the business. Yeah, fast, that's, fascinating that's when it comes to, to mind. Add that value. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Carl, Hinge does a lot of research, uh, specifically in the architecture and your other verticals, a research-based focused practice to identify what firms are currently dealing with. So in other words, so your firm is very relevant to its clientele. We now, try. <laughs> what, <laughs> what are some of the top issues that you see facing architecture firms today? Mm -hmm. as it mm -hmm. relates to what Hinge does? Well, I'd say one, uh, very broadly, we, we categorize this as strategy and planning issues. So what, what types of thing, and this is actually mirrored by clients, right? Architecture firms and their clients are dealing with some of the same issues around how do we structure in this new environment? What, what, uh, areas of business are really taking off, what will struggle, how do we reconfigure our organization uh, to deal with these things. So that's one where there's a, there's a real opportunity for solidarity and relevancy uh, in that, you know, I think the architecture uh, practices are going through some of the same challenges that their clients are from that respect. And that's uh, in that respect, they're very, very aligned. Uh, so you can share some of the same, same kinds of approaches. Uh, I think another is one of the diversity of business, and this is getting a little bit into the grains. And actually, in in preparation for our talk, I looked a little bit at preliminary findings, and so this is uh, not published yet. Uh, but one of the things that we're seeing in our our most um, current study is this trend around um, you know how do we how do we get our culture more visible how do we uh, how do we share the process of how we do not just the things that we do I think that's something that's uh, pretty specific to the architecture community because it is so community tied in many cases uh, there's there's certainly uh, very specific design practices with focus and market or or types of work, but many many design practices are so tightly interwoven with their communities uh, that we see a, a really a really big pickup in the understanding of how important that is. I don't I don't think it's a new it's not a new uh, finding as as far as we've seen. We've been doing this for you know, it's a 10 some years we've been asking similar similar questions along these lines, but I think the recognition has really taken off and that impacts everything from 
new business, how we appear and what, how we need to position ourselves uh, to even talent, you know, whether that's, um, that's right sizing in this environment, you know, there are some quick pivots going on and that, that can be painful or can be flipped into an opportunity. We've helped a lot of design clients really make that turn from, um, you know, say for example, uh, serving design for sporting events and switching to some other areas that were still moving very strongly. Um, you know, and how, how do you, how do you still stay engaged with those folks and help, help those audience through their struggles as well? Because they will come back. It will come back. It will just be different. I think we're just, just on the tip of that to use a sports analogy. Now we're getting into the televised. It's more virtual. They're adapting. And so we're seeing the design community, although it's, it's not the same type of work, it can still be, uh, it can still be engaged. It's just got a different challenge challenge on deck. Mm. Carl, you talk about this idea of showing not just the end product, but being open or engaging with the, the process. Mm -hmm. And you say that this is an opportunity for architecture firms. Can you help us understand what, what does that mean to you? How could a firm do that? Mm -hmm. So think of, think of how we are selected, right? How do you choose the best uh, design expert or design team? Uh, for something it is it's not just an example of other projects work you, you essentially have to trust that expert to understand what you need so there is a you know along with culture and relevancy um, and how do you build that trust before you've gotten a chance to work together Right. So if you think of the selection process, which is largely self-guided these days, it's not um, we're not showing up at events and, you know, hey, shake hands and let me walk you through this great process and how we, you know, our creative process and how we envision these things working and all of that. That's that's a rare opportunity these days. Uh, it's also something that is it's a it's a thought process going on with buying teams that's multiple people. There's not one decision maker anymore, almost ever. Um, so how do you build trust uh, in your expertise across a broad team and kind of uh, telepathically understand what's important to those folks? Well, that's, that's where it comes back to your question. Understanding, you know, if, if I was selecting you, Enoch, how do you think? How do you solve design problems? Does that match either with the great things that I've heard about you? Does it match with my philosophy and what I would be looking for in a trusted expert? Uh, am I convinced that in your thought process, not your work, but in your thought process and approach and what's important to you, that you're going to get me? You're going to get what my my firm needs or what I need uh, from the design process. That's essentially what, what, what you're working to do. And a lot of times in this kind of disconnected space, you know, people, people find you, you don't necessarily have a chance to even meet them first, but. Carl, how would you suggest that firms go about finding out what their clients issues are so they can become more relevant in their practice when Clients may be guarded. They may not even know themselves exactly what they're dealing with. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great point. And, you know, I, the easy answer is, oh, well, just listen. Listen to your clients, right? Ask the questions. Of course, they're going to tell you. And, uh, it, humans do not like to share bad impressions, for one. You never like to deliver good news. That's just human nature. So some things that you maybe could be doing better those will be avoided pretty much at all costs, unless you're really in trouble, then, then you'll hear about it. Uh, but it being the target of the insights that you're looking to gain often puts you at a great disadvantage. So absolutely listening is important. And actually that story that I shared earlier, that came from on the ground listening teams, understanding, asking questions of what was around the work process, 
to, to understand the context of issues that were being solved. That's one way. That's, that's still, that will never go out of style. The active listening, engaging with clients, understanding not just the pieces that you're working on, but the, the greater picture, that's one. Two, to address that, that human nature and kind of giving direct feedback, that's where doing third-party research, you know, whether it's a qualitative or quantitative studies, those can be hugely valuable. Uh, I'll give you an example, and this is uh, welcome to the Hinge Kitchen. When we're looking to understand insights about ourselves, we go through great, great pains to distance our interview team from us so that it is more objective uh, because by nature, you're not going to get the same response that way. Um, it's also, you know, speaking of expertise, and this is maybe a little bit meta, working with a consultant that understands how to structure a survey or how to interview correctly. That's a whole science. And we actually have a behavioral scientist on our team, one of our partners, that is, that is his discipline. The difference between quality survey design analysis, building the narratives and, you know, versus here, I'm going to do a survey in SurveyMonkey. I'm going to, did you like us? Did you not like us? There's, you know, what do you think of our services? There is a very, very big difference. We often, as an example, ask the same question, you know, three or four different ways, placed strategically through an interview to understand what responses are in context of what that respondent might be thinking about. Our interviewers are trained to mirror speech patterns and listen to to how that respondent is answering and probe without biasing to get a fulsome response and that's you know that's years of discipline just like design is its own discipline that's uh, that's its own craft in itself carl hinch talks a lot about the idea of the the visible expert what do you define as what is a visible expert that's a great question uh, it can take different forms. You know, I think it would apply to most, if not all of our clients that they have expertise. They have some pretty well-defined expertise. And in fact, that's, that's part of our vetting process to understand is that delivery on point? Are they valued and credible experts? That's something that, you know, putting on the hinge the hinge perspective, we can't we can't help address that. So let's assume that that's a base that uh, who we're talking about is an expert in their craft and can build that. Uh, the visibility factor, so becoming a visible expertise, means taking that expertise that's valued. Maybe you're the best kept secret in your craft in your profession, and helping to gain more visibility to the audiences that matter. Not to everyone. And I, I say this, uh, my background, I actually came early career from dot-com e-commerce into B2B and before finding my way into professional services. It, it's very different in that there are only specific audiences that really matter. And so focusing, focusing that uh, really makes a difference. So you may not be visible to everybody, but if you think of the grade of visible experts from starting from uh, best kept secret up to, you know, global superstar, you know, your Steve Jobs, there's a there's a spectrum in between. Uh, but I think the path, especially for professional services, you know, design professionals, you want to consider who are the audiences that I need to be very visible to. That when I think of this. You know, if I'm thinking of historic preservation, I'm thinking of this team. I'm thinking of these people, and they are super visible in this space. And then there might be a perspective of geography, although that becomes less less relevant as you scale. Uh, but I think especially for design professionals, and this is a difference from professional services at large, I think region does matter. And there are, because of that community tie, you know, there's a stronger connection to geographic visibility, uh, being tapped in and participating with communities and, and that type of work that can really foster that visibility. So uh, visibility on itself, 
you know, by itself is not the be all end all. It's closely related to reputation, right? So visibility and reputation, we like to think of that as your overall brand strength. Uh, but you know, definitely building visibility is probably one of the hardest things for, for such craftsmen and craftswomen, you know, in the design space, because it's, you know, our, our attention is on the craft. It's not in things like, I'm going to write this article about how I think about my design process, or I'm going to dedicate all of the time perfecting, you know, a, a speaking uh, topic for this event that I know, you know, half of my clientele, my best clientele is going to attend. That's a lot of effort. That in itself is a craft, but often not recognized as the same. It's seen as, oh, well, that's that's for other people. If I if I do good work, field of dreams, you know, people will come to me. And that's that's really not true anymore. Referrals are still important, but that visibility is crucial. That's a perfect segue into my next question, Carl, which is at, at Hinge, you help firms be able to get more visibility, specifically their experts, working with them, training them, and also helping them directly. What have been the most effective ways that you and your team have seen for firms and experts to get more visibility about what they do? Because the last thing they want to do is be doing this great work off in a dark corner where no one ever hears about it. Right. And like you said, they're the best kept secret. Right. Right. It, it, you know, think of it. And, and Enoch, I love uh, what you write about and speak about so much in the you know personal satisfaction. I want to say to your audience, there is personal satisfaction in visibility, too, even though it feels uncomfortable at times. There is satisfaction in building that and it, it can help people in a very significant way. Um, you know, if if you're asking how. How do you become visible? I wish I had one answer for that. I'd, I'd be doing something else if I had the one, one answer, but it, it does go back to what we were speaking about earlier with listening. I think the first part of the process is understanding what are your comfort zones? What are the places to begin with? Are you more comfortable speaking naturally? Are you more comfortable having a conversation? Or are you more comfortable writing? Okay, so I'm, I'm simplifying, but w which types of channels would best suit your craft or where you're naturally comfortable? And that becomes a foundation to build upon. Now, certainly, we have a lot of data and analytics on what types of uh, media really engage well with the specific audience, even broken down into markets. Like what are the different markets and type of personas and, and design audience? However, that mix has to take into account the team that's delivering it too. So understand what is, how does the audience absorb and what are the strongest ways that you're going to communicate? I mean, we have, uh, I can tell you every, every different has every, client has some different combination of, you know, writing strength, speaking strength, doing video, uh, and, and different members. If it's a larger team, you can complement uh, with strengths from different members. If it's a single, understanding where you're headed and where your audience lives uh, gives you a good work plan. Start where you're most comfortable and then continue building out from there. Well, Carl, what would you recommend to firm owners that they may not see themselves as the best speakers, and certainly they don't want to get up in front of a crowd and speak. Uh, perhaps they don't feel like they're the best writers as well. I mean, really what they do is they love to draw. That's really what they're best at. What would you recommend for someone like that who's really an expert at their craft, but perhaps it's neither the speaking nor the writing that they feel really comfortable engaging in? How about a design a day? And you can sketch something out and post. Um, joking aside, it, there are um, certainly visual, <laughs> visual communication is important and that can be a place to really uh, define yourself and differentiate. However, most audiences are going to respond well to either, you know, whether it's verbal, video or writing. Uh, in that case, uh, a ghostwriter or a, a production team of some type 
can be a huge, huge asset and worthy investment. And if you think about it in your business, no matter what, you're going to have to convey uh, your concepts, your thoughts verbally or written format. But that could be at you know your comfort level. If it's a bulleted list, great. You can start with that. If it's a simple interview uh, with an expert that you trust and they can craft that into something with your voice, then take advantage of that. You know, there are different levels. I mean, Hinge does not suit everybody. We're not the cheapest game in town. And, uh, you know, we, we have our own specifics. Uh, but there are lots of very talented writers, uh, creative folks that can help bring that out or give you some of that presence. I do think at some point, if, uh, if you or your team are serious about gaining visibility, it does have to come back to you. I don't think there's any really great way to completely dodge that bullet and still be genuine and yourself. And you know, essentially, especially if you're small, if you've hung out your, your shingle, your single practice, that is you. Your personality has to come through somehow. Uh, but I think there are creative ways to do that. Mm. I mean, that's a powerful insight. I see so often that uh, the firms that naturally seem to succeed are the ones that led by people who have a natural charisma, perhaps, uh, perhaps they're natural networkers. They don't mind getting in front of people. Not only do they not mind, they actually enjoy it. It's sort of part of their personality. Or, as you said, they're also good in another sort of language medium like, like writing. Or they have mm -hmm. someone on their team who is... Mm -hmm. Carl, if you were to get out your crystal ball that I know you're hiding underneath your desk right there, yeah, pull it out of the jacket pocket. What are the trends and forces that you're seeing are going to be affecting architects and AEC firms in general over the next, say, five to 10 years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I will say, again, recency bias. You cannot ignore what we're in right now. Um, some of the trends that we've seen for AEC firms over the last five, 10 years, the shortage of top talent, that very competitive uh, push for getting you know, top design teams as you, as you build and scale, that's not going anywhere. Uh, I think what's going to change significantly is the work-life balance, how we work, how remotely we work, how teams flex. I don't think those changes are going to go anywhere. Uh, this pandemic will have probably, i just taking a guess here, but I think it's going to have some pretty significant lasting impact in the work culture. Uh, so I think that's going to be important. And the technology that supports that is going to be really important. Uh, whether that's design collaboration tools, we're already uh, moving into a, an era where we see more and more collaboration. And that sometimes is a challenge into, you know, figuring out who's on first, who is actually leading, how collaborative is efficient versus, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen. I think we're going to see more and more shades of that. But as we start to leverage more of these collaborative and, you know, I'll, I'll make finger quotes, uh, seamless design and communication tools on projects, I think that some of those challenges will decrease and others will increase. But that that movement, you know, that's where the crystal ball gets shaky. Um, the the other thing I think we'll see a lot of, and you know, this depends whether you're residential. Uh, I actually deal with less uh, residential uh, design practices than commercial, but certainly on the commercial side, I think we're going to see more of the private public. Uh, programs that's going to continue to gain strength, and I think that's independent of what happens geopolitical uh, conversation aside. I think you, you're going to see more and more of that. The tools are driving it, the practice itself, the financials are driving more and more of that. Um, on the residential side, that's that's anybody's guess. I think it's a very uh, uncertain time right now. Like how how uh, how those practices are going to play out, what types of, um, what types of uh, designs are going to be really in demand. I think we're going to see a lot of shifts in that space, a lot of flexible uh, spaces. You know, if you, you take, uh, you know, what we're going through right now with home and workspaces kind of, you know, 
combining together, you're going to see more and more of that probably. Um, but again, I think for all what we've been speaking about, the communication tools, that's not going to go back. I mean, this uh, essentially we've seen, and this has been very clear in all the studies we've had, the trend that we were projecting with, you know, kind of the in-person networking activities and communication tools, that movement into the digital space, you know, went from zero to 500 miles an hour overnight. We're absolutely eager to see each other in person, but many of these interactions will stay. And, and what we've seen uh, qualitative and quantitatively is that many of, many of the audiences and design firms that were skeptical of that have now seen the power of it. I mean, it, you, can't, you can't ignore it. I mean, in, in work uh, conversations, like actually on projects, in business development, uh, websites uh, have become a much, much more visible tool within organizations. So seeing how that can be, you know, business intelligence as well as communication, I think that's going to be a big, a big learning. You know, I, I kind of look at our AEC in general, and this this may not be as relevant on everyone's mind right now, but I'll go out on a limb and make a prediction that. A lot of the conversations that you're seeing in the consumer space related to digital surveillance, uh, big data, understanding what large groups are doing, I, I think we have barely scratched the surface in our industry of, of what that means. And I think that's going to have very broad implications from solopreneurs all the way up to the gigantic design firms. I think in one sense, uh, the big design firms have really embraced research and uh, you know, understanding objectively how they're tapping into you know, urban agenda or you know, the built, built environment on a, on a broad scale. I think that trickling down to everyone and uh, creating that accessibility, that's going to be, I think, a big shift in the next five to 10 years. Got it. That makes makes a lot of sense. Carl, you're obviously used to being interviewed, very well spoken. You provide a lot of great information here. I'm sure you do a lot of podcast interviews and appearances because you yourself are, as you encourage others to be a visible expert. So I'm curious to ask you what what's a question perhaps that that I that I should have asked, but I, I didn't. I love I love that question and and thank you. It's really just because I, I drink a lot of coffee. I'll, I'll give that all yeah, the credit. I figured. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think one question that you may have asked is, where where do you start? If you're, I, you ask this in, in certain ways, but I think overall, if, if I were a small to mid-size design firm and I recognize that, hmm, I'm not connecting with the conversation in a way that some of my competitors are, or I see the world changing around me in this virtual space and you know how people are making decisions and I'm not sure what to do. How do I prioritize what I'm doing? That's something that we hear a lot. And I think it, it goes from large to small, but as, as especially small, I think it's really, it can be an overwhelming proposition to just figure out what do I start with first? Would that be, is that a good question? I think it's a great one. How would you answer that? I think, you know, taking, taking a step back to the very beginning of our discussion around relevancy. And I think this intersects with a lot of the things that I really enjoy uh, hearing from you, Enoch. Thinking about relevancy as a two-way street, right? In your audience that you serve, how are they relevant to you and your fulfillment? And where do you see yourself ending up? And then how are you relevant to your, to your audiences today? Where do you see the shortcomings? I think that's the first question to ask yourself because especially as you're beginning to scale, you know, 
keeping that fire in your belly and the satisfaction and balance with your lifestyle is hugely, hugely important. Uh, and really that's going to allow you whatever channel you you're most comfortable with, that's going to allow you to have a, a deeper level of conversation, build that trust through whatever method, be genuine, because it's going to be something that's important to you as well as to your audience. So however you, you start that process, I and mean, whether it's you know, a good soul searching, look in the mirror and, and take, a, take a step out of the daily craft to consider that, or you take the step and, you know, bring someone in to help get outside of your head, you know, look at the business, you know, the business side uh, of, of consulting and what you need to do to, to really build your practice. I, I would say that that is the first start. The rest of it, once you identify that, it will click into place, you know, and, and think of what is the kindling. I think one of the, one of the pitfalls I see in uh, design teams and Full disclosure, my, my wife is a creative, not, not an architect, but a writer. And I see parallels with uh, architects and anything that is this beautiful craft. There's a, there's a strong drive for perfection, right? I've got to make this. It's, you know, it's like the old joke, like engineers, if it is you know, satisfactory, that's great praise. If you said that to an architect, it's like, what did I do wrong? How, how is it just satisfactory? That is not even close to enough. So give yourself a break. I think that's, that's what I would start with. Figure out how to take that first leap in a way that fulfills you and then build from that. Uh, I think the architects have a great advantage in that focus on the craft because just treat this as another related craft, uh, visibility. Mm. Mm. I, I, I love the analogy you made to engineering there. It brought me back to my uh, structural days back in school. And, of course, engineers, they what's really interesting about engineering is they engineer to fail, right? So they basically <laughs> take something as, as, as far as they can, considering the strength requirements, and they, they basically know the failure point of it. Right. And it's interesting because as architects, uh, we're, we're a little bit of the opposite. We want to take things to perfection. Right. That's and right. so it's like, whereas engineers take things to a certain point and they know that that's the balance. It seems like that's something that, um, that is a very difficult balance to achieve as a design firm when you don't have, you know, a strengths book to open up and see exactly what the elasticity of steel is. You know, it's mm -hmm. more of an organic process. So th right. thank you so much for joining us today. Carl, appreciate it. As, as I mentioned before, Carl Feldman is a partner at Hinge, Hinge Marketing. And Carl, where can people go to find out more about you and your firm? I would just go right to our website, hingemarketing.com. You can also look us up on uh, LinkedIn, but we have all the links on our website. Lots of great free material on there. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great resource. Well, thanks again, Carl. Thanks, Enoch. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.